Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Dick Broderson, and we're welcoming back Colin Roach here today, the CIO of Discipline Funds. And Colin, our audience just loves you. Your last appearance of episode 370, Masterclass in Inflation, has been one of the absolutely most downloaded We Start Billionaires episodes we ever had. So with all of that being said and putting maximum pressure on you here, Colin, <laughs> thanks for making time yet again to come on the show. Hey, Stig. Thanks for having me again. I'm not sure if it's, uh, is it so much that inflation and and my comments on it were popular or just super controversial and people were uh, were spreading them because they hated them? <laughs> who knows? Who knows? But like, whenever we checked the numbers, it was just like, boom, like hundreds of thousands of people. And it was, I don't know, people loved it. And I loved it too. So let's just say it was it's for all the good, the good things. Uh, <laughs> uh, but jumping right into here, uh, jumping right into the outline of the show, uh, Colin, uh, we're going to talk about ETF investing uh, today. And you know, we we know that we should find an investment strategy that is right for us. And there are many great strategies, uh, but we also wanted to pair with our unique personalities. Uh, for example, here on the show, uh, we have we have this rule of thumb that if you don't read a company's financial statements typically you shouldn't invest in that specific company. And the reason is just that whenever things turn sour, which just happens at some point in time during the lifetime of, of you holding that stock, you really truly need to understand uh, the specific company you invested in. It just gives you a conviction. So, um, you know, there's just a way of, you know, pairing your personality with the investment strategy. So keeping that in mind, you know, we haven't covered ETF investing as much as, you know, individual stock picks. Uh, and ETF investing is uh, is your field of expertise. So, how do I how do I know which ETF and which ETF strategy that is right for me? Yeah, I mean that's a really I always tell people investing is so personal. I mean, we have these all these little clicks and sort of groups that focus on different types of strategies and different narratives and whatnot, and everyone's kind of combative about it to some degree, but everyone's so different and and all of this requires so much customization and so i start from a very general framework where when i'm typically working with somebody or trying to explain to them how they might allocate their assets i always tell people that you should really start from a first principles perspective so i start from the idea that the term investing and i think i've mentioned this in maybe some of my past appearances that the term investing is actually somewhat misleading. From an economics perspective, the term investing means to spend for future production. And what we technically do when we buy stocks and bonds, we're not technically investing. A firm invests when they spend money for future production. So when, when Tesla's building their cars, they're spending for future production. And But when we buy Tesla stock, we are literally allocating our savings to an instrument that will derive its returns based on how well the firm invests. And so when you work from that methodology or that perspective, you kind of arrive at a different conclusion where investing is oftentimes viewed as this very sexy sort of get rich uh, endeavor, whereas the idea of saving is much more prudent. And that's the foundation I typically try to, to get people to work from. And the reason that I focus so much on, on ETFs and index funds and just indexing in general is because when you're saving, you generally need to diversify across lots of different asset classes. And the goal really is to diversify your assets in such a way that you're meeting certain liability needs over time. So for instance, everybody needs to hold some cash. Holding cash, I always tell people, cash is the worst investment in the long run. But in the short term, in terms of principal needs and being able to meet your liabilities, cash is the best investment because it's the one that provides you with the liquidity and the ability to be able to meet those those daily weekly or monthly cash flow needs so to me a lot of this is about matching your personal assets and liability needs across time and so the reason that i like to focus so much on on diversified low cost indexing is because if you view your savings and a big bucket of your of your asset allocation as this portfolio that needs to meet these certain needs. Well, diversifying across ETFs is just a very good way to be able to achieve a lot of diversification in a very low cost and diversified way. So a lot of this is about setting very clear goals up front, knowing 
you know, are you someone who is trying to beat the market or are you someone who's trying to save for retirement and meet certain liquidity needs? And then kind of filtering through what I would say is more of a of an evidence based approach to investing and working from the approach of really trying to to more so control what you can control rather than a lot of people try to you, you can't control what Tesla is going to earn next year but you can control you can control what the for instance the taxes and fees you might pay on that instrument are um so you can control things like taxes fees your asset allocation and the the biggie that I'm focused on is is behavior um so those are the four big ones that you can really control. And so when you're picking ETFs and you're looking at what asset classes you want to own to diversify across those ETFs, you need to figure out really what your personal needs are and what, what goals you're trying to achieve so that then you can apply the right components. Because by this point, there are there are thousands and thousands of ETFs available. There's going to be thousands and thousands more. It's one of the fastest growing segments in, in the financial services industry. Mutual funds are going to continue to convert at an, you know, a blistering rate in the coming 10 years because the ETFs are just superior products in so many ways. So there's a lot of different options out there and you need to, you know, I'm not giving a very customized answer because this is not a very customized or I'm sorry, I'm I'm not giving a very customized answer because this is such a customized approach to to the way we have to actually pick and choose these things. So Colin, I can't help but but ask this question because we as as much as, as this episode is about ETF investing, you know, I as an individual stock picker and we have so many in the audience who do pick individual stocks. You know, I, I always think about like uh, whenever, for instance, you see uh, ETF investing uh, and passive um, tracking really be on, be on the rise, you know, um, this stat here we have like the S&P 500 that's held in, in, in passive indexes and ETFs or mutual funds that's risen by 0.5 percentage points in 20, uh, 2021. So it's like at now at 18.3%, at the highest it's ever been. So keep in mind uh, that a lot of our audience are individual stock pickers. Should we see this as a good thing or a bad thing that more money is pouring into, into passive investing? You know, this is a really hot debate in the last five to 10 years, especially as the market seems to be on this just sort of perpetual upward trend. And a lot of people say that that's due to trends like passive investing. I, you know, one of the more the, the most interesting aspects of going through all the regulatory process of actually building an ETF is that you get into the weeds on these debates with and these definitions with SEC examiners and the people who, you know, are, are advising you on the legal on this on everything. And so one of the the big definitions that you come across is this active versus passive. And it's interesting because I would argue that working from a really strict sort of technical definition, there is no such thing as passive investing. So to me, there is one truly passive portfolio in the world. And that portfolio is the, it's the portfolio of all the world's uh, financial assets, basically. And the truth is that nobody holds that portfolio. But if you were, if you were buying into a purely efficient market hypothesis perspective, that's the portfolio that you would buy and you would never deviate from it. You would just let the market cap weighting drift as it would. Nobody can buy that portfolio. And so the, one of the main reasons is because literally that portfolio is not investable. Even, you know, I went through, I built a global stock allocation within the ETF. The interesting thing is that when you look at global market cap, I went back and forth with, with various attorneys on the definitions of this. Global market cap weighting does not have a consistent definition. And everybody, literally everybody calculates it wrong. So even FTSE All World, which is what Vanguard Total World is based on, it literally buys like 70% of global equities. So it's missing 30% of the global slice because so much of this is not investable. And so when people talk about passive, I think there's a little bit of salesmanship in the way that the industry has framed this. And the term passive implies that this is some sort of market cap weighted um, pure market portfolio when the reality is that 
Vanguard has actively chosen to deviate from what the true global market cap weighting is. If you buy something like a 60-40 stock bond index, that's not a, a truly passive index. That a, the, the people that built that 60-40 index, they constructed that index in a very active way in that they're deviating from usually to a domestic all stock or all bond allocation. And they're choosing, they're actively choosing not to hold literally tens of thousands of global instruments within that portfolio. And they're deviating from what the actual global market cap of stocks to bonds is in a relative sense. So right now it's about 45, 55. So 60, 40 is actually a, an active deviation in a much more aggressive way that I would argue is not that passive. So it, it's a weird thing to think about because when you get into the, the really fine details of it, you sort of realize that everyone's active and everyone is, is choosing to be active for some specific reason. And there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. I mean, there's, there's bad ways to be active. You know, like I would argue day trading is a bad way to be active, but if you're building a portfolio that is, you know, in line with your risk profile and is just really well balanced and diversified across the 60 40 and you're rebalancing that thing once a year i would argue you're technically being active but it's a pretty smart way to be active and stock picking falls into the same sort of bucket there's nothing inherently wrong with stock picking in fact indexers need stock pickers to be able to make the markets that they operate in so they provide the liquidity that makes indexing possible so and that's a, a whole other aspect of this discussion where when we break this thing down into this binary argument, we're ignoring the fact that active needs passive to even be able to exist. So I look at it as sort of two sides of the same coin in that when, when I'm constructing a passive index or what we call a passive index, and underneath the surface, that passive index fund is incredibly active. I mean, you should see the Vanguard trading desk. This thing's humongous. They, these guys are sitting around trading stocks and bonds all day. And yet this firm is known as the passive indexing firm when they're one of the biggest market making and trading firms in the entire world. And so that's the underbelly of this discussion that I think a lot of the sort of salesmanship and the narratives ignore. And so long story short, I don't think you can break this thing down into this sort of neat little argument where one is necessarily bad or, you know, is passive good and pa and active or is active good and passive evil, because in a lot of ways, they're they're just two sides of the same coin and they're codependent on one another. So, Colin, one thing we, we, we can see here uh, in the market is that ETF investing has just continuously been growing for for decades uh, very much at the expense of mutual funds um could you please take us through some of the some of the technical things about etf investing because i i think that as investors we see a lot of the front end we don't really see what's what's really going mm -hmm. on uh you know we have the creation redemption process there are different tax benefits to consider and, and a lot of that is not well understood um could you please go through that process uh with us yeah, it's really you know, one of the neat things about building these things and actually going through the whole process of of working with everybody, you know, along the whole process of of how this these funds actually work is that you see the underbelly of everything. And so one of the most interesting things about ETFs is so for anyone who doesn't know, an ETF is just it's basically a mutual fund that trades like a stock. Um, and so it the neat thing and the the big advantage of ETFs over mutual funds is that they have this creation redemption process where a market maker and the ETF issuer can literally create new shares of the ETF from thin air. So for instance, with, with a new fund, they're technically, or not even technically, there is no market for that fund when it's issued. There, there are no sellers of the ETF because nobody holds the ETF yet. So the way this that these funds become liquid and the reason why a fund that is not even widely traded or doesn't have a lot of volume on any given day the reason that that thing can actually be incredibly liquid is because the market makers can create shares from nothing and as long as they're incentivized to be able to 
arbitrage the underlying basket. Well, they'll make a tight market for that thing if they know the underlying value. And so to kind of get into the, the nuts and bolts of how these things work basically is that the way to think of an ETF is that there is a basket of underlying assets and that underlying set of instruments has what's called a, uh, an basically an, uh, they call it the INAV. It's the essentially the intraday NAV. So it's the intraday net asset value of the, of the underlying assets. And the way that a market maker calculates that is by looking at the, all of the underlying assets, and then they're able to quantify in real time exactly what the underlying basket is worth. And so they're looking at the true value of the underlying basket. And then what they're doing is with the ETF, they're trading the ETF and basically creating or redeeming it for people based on supply and demand. And so they're able to look at the value of the underlying assets. And then if they're incentivized to do so, let's say that you put in an order for $25 to buy SPY, for instance, a market maker will look at that and they'll he'll look at what the S&P 500 is actually worth. And let's say it's worth $24.98. Well, he'll create shares of the ETF at $25 and make a market at $25. And what he's able to do is they're able to then go into the market. They will create, the issuer will create shares of the ETF. The, the market maker will essentially sell short the ETF to the buyer that creates a market for the buyer and then the the market maker goes in and they buy the actual underlying at $24.98 they'll then close out the position and because they've 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 sold the ETF to you they'll close out their underlying and they've made they've booked a 2 cent profit essentially and so they're able to not only keep the spreads very tight on that instrument, but they're able to make a market in something that literally does not exist because they're able to essentially instantly arbitrage what the value of those things are in a relative sense. So you're in a sense, you're sort of paying for the liquidity in a sense of these things, um, even though they don't they don't technically trade that much or or they might not even exist in this instance. But that creation redemption process is really it's the it's the the distinctive element of ETFs that makes them not only function very efficiently, but more importantly, this process makes them super tax efficient. And so when compared to a mutual fund, the problem with a mutual fund is that when you send money to a mutual fund, you literally kick them cash. And the mutual fund manager has to go in and buy all of the underlying assets. I don't do that. When somebody invests money in an ETF, I don't go out and reallocate the fund. I don't actually distribute cash to anything. So there are no purchases underlying all of this that go on. Whereas with a mutual fund, the mutual fund has to actually go out, distribute cash, buy all of the underlying assets. And if they are selling stuff along the way, they're incurring capital gains. And this is the big problem with mutual funds is that mutual funds are unfairly punitive with the way that they distribute their capital gains because you could buy a mutual fund at the end of the year and if that fund has large capital gains you can get kicked a tax bill even though you don't actually have a capital gain and so this process of creation and redemption inside of a mutual fund is very inefficient because it's it's basically a cash based reallocation process whereas in the ETF the underlying the market maker and the issuer are they're actually exchanging the underlying in an, what's called an in-kind transaction. And so they're not actually making a cash sale of the underlying assets, which allows the ETF to operate in a, frankly, a much fairer way because it gives the control of the tax liability to the shareholder. So rather than being forced into a capital gain in the way that a mutual fund often does, the ETF puts the power of the tax liability in the shareholder where I control the tax liability based on when I want to sell it rather than the actions of thousands of other people buying and selling the fund within within itself. So let's let's continue talking about costs. You know, ETFs are very often promoted for the low cost associated with it. Uh, costs that are typically lower than comparable uh, mutual funds. 
Uh, and whenever I look at uh, an ETF, you know, I, I very often look at the expense ratio. Like to me, that that sounds like that's the expense I'm gonna have by holding this this asset. Um, so, do you have other expenses if I if I buy an ETF? And let's just disregard any commission that my broker might you know impose on me. Um, yeah. So, well, commissions are, are obviously they're kind of going away as you mentioned, but um, the the biggies are so you. ETF expense ratios can be a little bit confusing because you actually have a you have a gross expense ratio and a net expense ratio. The gross expense ratio is the is typically the total cost of running the ETF for the actual um, the actual issuer. So typically they will discount that to some degree, and that arrives at a net expense ra ratio. Uh, expense ratio. That's the the net expense ratio is the is the fee that the the shareholder actually will pay. And typically this is waived for a period of like 12 to 24 months. Um, I tend to find this way too confusing. I typically think they should, you know, the fees should be the same, but that's just sort of my philosophical belief. Um, so those are two things to pay attention to is that the net expense ratio is the, that's the fee that you're going to pay. And you have to pay attention to whether or not that fee is waived for 12 months or 24 months or you know, maybe it's waived in perpetuity. Who knows? Every fund is different. But the other big one with ETFs is the bid ask spread. So you, like I was saying before, one of the reasons why ETFs operate so efficiently is because the market makers are incentivized to make markets in this thing. And the reason they're incentivized to make markets in this thing is because they're getting paid to make the market in that thing. And you're paying the spread basically on the way that fund works. So like I said, with the previous example, when SPY is actually worth $24.98 and the market maker is selling it to you for $25, well, you have the benefit of being able to buy SPY at a very liquid and relatively close price to what its underlying intraday NAV is, is actually at. But of course, you're paying the two cents to the market maker. So that's one of the underlying costs. So if you see very, very wide spreads on an ETF, you have to consider, um, you know, it, that that's actually part of the upfront. It's essentially a, a form of a commission is really the way to think of it, that the, the market maker is earning a commission basically for making that trade and making that market for you. The other big cost is that ETFs can trade at a, a premium or a discount. And that's usually a function of how liquid the underlying are worth. So how tight can the market maker keep the current uh, market price of the actual instrument relative to its INAV. And that's not always easy to do. So for instance, if you have very like illiquid underlying instruments in the underlying, well, the market maker is probably going to keep much wider spreads on the ETF because he has to sort of cover his butt in the case that he discovers that the underlying are not worth nearly what they're actually selling the ETF for. So you have to pay attention to the, the the premium versus the discount, and this can be this can be tricky for retail investors because retail investors don't always know what the well, really they they rarely know what the INAV actually is. So typically, on a very very liquid fund, the the INAV will be very very close to whatever the bid ask is. But on a less liquid fund, you could have a a situation where a an ETF is is really worth the underlying is worth $25 and the spread could be 25 to 25 10 and the because the underlying is very illiquid you might think it's a good idea to buy that thing at 25 10 and you might be paying a you could you know you're paying a 10 cent premium basically and that's where the fund will trade but it's in the long run uh it's a it's an important element to be mindful of because like closed end funds, ETFs, even though they tend to be much closer to the the net asset value, they can trade at these at these premiums and discounts. So, one thing I wanted to talk to you about here, because we are, you know, we're I guess we're all always looking for the best way to to accumulate wealth, um, and you know, one thing that that has been popular for many years is to look at back testing. And you know, I'm 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 very torn whenever it comes to to back testing. Uh, it's it's definitely something we see a lot of in the ETF space here because you have ETFs out there that really show an impressive back testing you know record. 
uh, you know, them, it might be that they're buying companies that has the lowest PEs or highest dividend yield, highest share repurchase yield, whatever it might be. And whenever you you look at at, at the track record for those back tested results, it's like you know, outperforming with three, five, six, whatever, right? It's it looks really, really good. And so whenever I look at ETF investing, I feel well, you know, I I feel really good about investing in something that has historically proven that, you know, that it's, it's a good strategy. But on the other hand, I'm always you know, constantly concerned, well, history repeats itself. You know, it's a cyclical trend. Is it like cyclical mm-hmm. trend, whatnot? How do, how do you think about investors, well, thinking about backtesting results whenever they're constructing their, their portfolios? Yeah, like you, I, I think you have to be really skeptical of of back tests because it's very easy to sort of backpedal into a back test that looks really good. I mean, everybody, if you're constructing a fund and trying to pick out, you know, what would be potentially the, you know, the best performing future assets, of course, you're going to, you know, typically you're going to, to look at what worked the best in the past. And the assumption is that, you know, this is sort of a, an extrapolative expectations, you know, process where people are extrapolating from the past and expecting everything to be the same in the future. And obviously, you know, it just doesn't work out that way. And so you have to be really skeptical of back testing. I, you know, it, you get into all of these finer discussions about like the necessity of forecasting and making predictions about the future. And, and I just sort of think that people need to embrace that. I typically fall into a more of a market cap weighted approach to indexing and and allocating assets just because to me i don't i don't pretend to know where in the stock market we we typically should be at any given time and so to me it's almost generally at least as a big portion of your portfolio to me it's better to just own it all rather than trying to to pick and choose which components um you know, obviously there's there's lots of ways to skin the cat here. But for me, when you're thinking about like your savings portfolio and your the core of your asset allocation and the piece that is just going to be sort of your more of your like your sleep well portfolio, to me, it's really about building in diversification and owning lots and lots of things, knowing that, well, there's going to be a lot of times when certain parts of that portfolio are going to do really badly and other parts are going to do really well. And that's, in in essence, that's why diversification works is because you have these uncorrelated assets that they aren't always doing the same stuff. And so you almost, you want some portion of your portfolio to be underperforming at times in a weird way. And backtesting, oftentimes what ends up happening is people will put together backtests and discover that, well, they found a whole bunch of assets that are that all perform really well in the past and then you find out that well in the future when things go badly well all those assets perform really badly and you don't have a lot of diversification in that portfolio so you kind of to me again going back to sort of first principles i like thinking of things sort of for what they are rather than trying to back test and then extrapolate what they might be and so you know looking at you could go back and, for instance, look at like a 30 year treasury bond and say, holy cow, this thing, I'm going to start a treasury bond ETF because treasury bonds have performed so well in the past. And you have to look at what that thing is today for what it is. And that instrument today is nothing like it was 30 years ago. That instrument 30 years ago was a 10 percent yielding 30 year instrument that had government backing. And today that instrument is a 2 percent yielding instrument that has the same credit quality instruments, but going forward in almost any reasonable expectation of the future, that instrument is a significantly risk, uh, a significantly worse risk adjusted position than it was, for instance, back in 1980 or 1990. So you have to be, that's a really simple example, but you have to be really skeptical of back testing because the future is always different the environment and i think after COVID, i think we all kind of know nobody knows what the hell's happening nobody knows what the future holds for all this stuff but you can formulate reasonable guesstimates about what these instruments will do and to me that's a much more sound way to look at the future rather than yeah the past is a nice guide 
Um, but it shouldn't be your only guide by any measure. So you know, one of the reasons why I'm so excited to to speak with you here today, uh, Colin, is that we have a lot of our listeners who really wants to to manage money. And you've done that for a long time, but but here very recently, uh, as of last month, you started your very own ETF. Um, could you please walk us through step by step, if possible? You know what happens from a moment you have this idea of, hey, I want to start an ETF, and then until the date it launches. I know it's a very big question. There are probably many steps, but could you could you break that down for us? Yeah, it's basically. It's basically hundreds of phone calls and emails with lawyers uh, back and forth is really what the, the majority of the process is. But, but no, I mean, in, in essence, um, it's um, it's a fairly they've made this a fairly smooth process today relative to what it used to be. So ten years ago, starting an ETF was a a monstrously difficult process because you needed what was basically called SEC exemptive relief to even be able to form the trust that's able to hold the assets that actually is really the underbelly of the of the ETF that you want to start but today there it's become much easier to do this with the the new SEC or the new ETF act and uh and really there's a number of ETF white label issuers now so in my case I worked with West Gray and Alpha Architect a lot of your listeners I'm sure know who um who they are because you've interviewed them in the past, but um, they offer a white label process where they're able to basically utilize the Alpha Architect ETF trust to help people like me who, I mean, I have a big asset management business. And so I have clients that are already using my strategy and the ETF is basically a really clean distilled version of the strategy that I'm already operating. The kicker with an ETF is that because you're able to put all of these so i run a fund of funds and i'm able to basically put my client portfolios into one etf which creates a huge amount of not just systematic efficiency but but also tax efficiency like we referred to earlier um but the process of starting this basically involves well first of all this is a hugely competitive area so like a lot of people were laughing because i started a fund of funds that basically is a global uh stock bond allocation and it's very similar to, although I'm technically referred to as an active fund, it, for all practical purposes, it's pretty passive. It's a, it's a fund of index funds. And so I hold basically a bunch of Vanguard funds inside of the ETF. And so it's, it's a weird thing because I'm referred to as active when technically it's, it's relatively passive in nature in the way that the fund actually operates. But from, in, in terms of, of the way that the the actual structure works when starting is well you need to have a good idea and you need to have an idea that is going to be viable because it's expensive to start an etf and so um the the kicker is that you need a, a relationship with a white label issuer and you need to convince this white label issuer that you're going to be able to make it worthwhile to them to be able to actually go through the process of, I mean, we'd spent nine to 12 months actually going through all the regulatory hurdles and getting all the, the legal details and regulatory stuff um, ironed out. And then, you know, so there's all these upfront costs. And the, the really, really strange thing about an ETF is that the way that the SEC views an ETF is that the way to think of it is that it's technically a rolling IPO. So like I mentioned, earlier when a market maker will go to the issuer and the issuer will be able to create new shares well each one of those instances is in in essence it's an initial public offering and so the sec views this stuff as sort of a rolling ipo and so with new securities they're very strict about the marketing and that's the thing that makes etf somewhat difficult if you're a new entrant into the field for instance it's very easy for vanguard to go out and market a new ETF because they have this big base of existing customers. Whereas if you're someone who's trying to start an ETF, well, you're stepping into this arena with a bunch of established, uh, you know, competitors and you can't talk about this thing until the day it's issued. So you're in a blackout period until the day this thing is issued. So I'm, you know, I was not even allowed to talk to friends and family technically about 
the ETF until September 21st on the day that it actually went live and it became a publicly available instrument. And so, and then going forward, the, the regulatory agencies are, they're, they're relatively strict about communications with the public because this is technically a rolling IPO is the way to think of it. So it, getting the word out and getting people to even know that you have this thing available, it might be the best ETF in the world and you might not be able to get it out to the public because it's just very difficult to educate people and get the, get the word out. So that's the, the probably biggest hurdle along the way is just getting people to even know that this thing exists in the first place. So one, one thing that's definitely known to a lot of people, if we can continue on that is whenever you have a stock that's IPOing and you know, we hear in the news that, oh, like this popped 10% or 30%. And one of the amazing, you know, entry into, uh, into New York Stock Exchange or, or whatnot. So there's a lot of buzz around that specific stock, but I also think it's important for retail investors to understand what this process is all about. You know, so for example, you would have an underwriter of an IPO. It could be Morgan Stanley. Uh, it could be JP Morgan, whatnot. And they would typically get around 7% 7, uh, 7 of the money raised. Uh, and they're typically you know, freshly minted shares. That's, that's how it goes. So uh, the current... Uh, shareholders would be, get their stake diluted a bit. It might be something along the lines of 10% that's getting uh, issued there. And so this would, you know, everything else, equal incentivize the investment bank to charge a somewhat high stock price. Mm -hmm. However, the investment bank that is promoting the stock, that's truly what it is. It is a promotion. Uh, you know, they have to sell that to institutional clients and, and they don't do that to retail investors. So that's also why you have this pop in the stock price. And, you know, if we just look over the past decade, it's averaging 21% of the very first day. Um, Snowflake, you know, there was a lot of buzz about it. There was at 112%. So this is a premium that we as retail investors are paying. And now so let's, let's talk about um, ETFs. So a retail investors as a, at a similar structural disadvantage compared to institutional investors whenever ETFs are being launched. You know, it, it's it was funny when I um when I was going through this process, so we we had to pick which exchange we were going to work with and uh, you know, I talked to Nasdaq and CBOE and and NYSE and it was interesting cuz like the NYSE came back and um you know they one of their big marketing pitches to us was um uh, was the the bell ring everybody knows about the bell ringing at the New York Stock Exchange and so I was thinking to myself ah I'm going to get to ring the bell at the New York Stock Exchange and the, the NYSE came back and they were like you know we you you shouldn't care about ringing the bell for an ETF and I was like, why? It's, this is awesome. I'm going to, you know, I'm IPOing a fund on your, on the New York Stock Exchange. That's amazing, isn't it? And they were like, well, to put this in perspective, this is totally different from a corporate IPO because thinking of a corporation, a corporation, you know, they raise funds and they build this company for a decade before or more, before anybody even knows what it is when they IPO on the New York Stock Exchange. And in a lot of ways, when that thing issues on the New York Stock Exchange, in a lot of ways, the the original investors are they're getting out or they're diversifying, they're selling their shares to the public and allowing the public to, you know, sort of reap the benefits going forward of whatever that that stock is going to do. And an ETF is just totally different because an ETF is issued but again it has this underlying net asset value where you know what the underlying net assets are actually worth whereas with a stock nobody necessarily knows what the the net asset value of tesla is today so in a lot of ways people are are doing some guesswork about what the actual underlying assets are worth and that's what the the ipo process is part of is it's it's allowing the public to value this thing hopefully in a manner that is more efficient than the way that the private market was was valuing this thing. Whereas with an ETF, you issue an ETF and the, the underlying assets have that net asset value and the supply and demand for the fund, it can create a premium or a discount 
for the way that the instrument trades, but the market makers know, they know exactly what that INAV is. So they know exactly what those underlying assets are worth. So if I hold a fund that is 50% SPY and 50% TLT, long-term treasuries, well, the, the market makers know exactly what those things are worth in their underlying value. And so if that, if I issue a new fund that holds those two ETFs and the market maker goes out and starts making a market for those things, and let's say again, that it, it IPOs at $25. And let's say that some knucklehead goes in and puts in a market order for $26. Well, the market makers know they have an instant $1 arbitrage there. So what they're going to do is they're going to make a market for you at $26 because that's the price you want to buy at. And they're going to instantly, they're going to sell those. They're going to buy the underlying. They're going to sell the underlying and they're going to sell you the ETF for $26. They will book their $1 per share profit on that instrument. And the, the price of the ETF will, will then collapse back down to 25 because in the long run, there aren't a lot of people who are willing to buy at a you know at a four or five percent premium to NAV, and so that's one of the reasons why ETFs work as efficiently as they do is because they're totally different in terms of the way they are structured. Because we actually know what the underlying NAV is, whereas with an individual stock, nobody really knows in real time what those things are actually worth. So. Perhaps someone out there are thinking, well, you know, it, it seems like it's a lot more approachable now to to run ETF. You know, you can wide levels, uh, wide label stuff, and and it seems like there is a, it's a lot easier today than perhaps it's, it's been in the past. So perhaps someone is thinking, well, call it. How much does it cost? <laughs> like, if <laughs> if someone's like, I want to do this, I have a great idea for for an ETF. Like, could you talk to us about the different costs you would have associated with with running an ETF? Yeah, I mean the so there's fixed there's fixed underlying costs of just being able to partner with, for instance, the the white label. You're basically paying for a very streamlined compliance and legal um, structure in doing so. So rather than you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to have to pay for the trust on my own and hire attorneys to work with and and new compliance firms. So you know, a firm like Alpha Architect makes it very clean to be able to just go in and essentially outsource all of that. And you're going to end up paying. I mean, it depends on the complexity of your fund. And I mean, my fund was very simple, very clean. And this thing, I mean, it will cost, I would, I would estimate that the, the base cost of, a, of most ETFs is probably you should expect to pay at least $200,000 a year for just the fixed fees that you're going to incur along the way. But the more complex you get, I mean, you could build an ETF that is futures based or, you know, options based. It's a lot more complex to run and, you know, or a Bitcoin ETF or something like that. And you can get, you know, really, really, you know, infinitely more complex than I did, in which case your costs are going to be a lot higher. And that doesn't even get to the biggest cost, which is in the long run, the biggest cost of running an ETF is going to be all your marketing, because again, it's difficult to get the word out if you're a, a small shop or, you know, if you're not, you don't have the, the Vanguard like marketing, you know, megaphone that, that a lot of these big firms have. And so in the long run, it, it depends on, you know, how much money you're willing to spend on advertising. And that's the, that's the thing. That's the big challenge with an ETF is that you spend all this time and money up front building the ETF and getting it ready to come to market. And you're not even allowed to talk about it. So nobody knows about this thing. And, and then when it IPOs, that's the first day anybody even knows about this thing. And so it's not like you get to do a road show and go and pitch this to the, to the whole world and let everybody know about it. You kind of just have to, you know, vomit this out to the world on day one. And then that's when the real work starts. So unlike a corporate IPO, in a lot of ways, starting a new ETF is the, the IPO day or the initial IPO day is really it's takeoff. It's the, the very beginning of the journey in a lot of ways. And so it, uh, it, it depends on you know, how much you're willing to spend 
um, not just upfront, but how much, you know, really how much marketing you can, you can be willing to spend and how well you can get this idea out to the public so that even if it's an incredibly great idea, you still need to be able to, to tell people and sell them on the idea that, Hey, this is something that I think can be helpful for you. As you know, our, our listeners are avid followers of Warren Buffett. That was that was the very core and 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 how we got founded in, in the first place. And and Warren Buffett placed this famous uh, one million dollar bet, uh, where he bet on a passive S and P five hundred index to outperform a fund of funds in hedge funds. Um, and at the time, whenever he made that bet, and and I should say, all the proceeds were going to charity. Uh, but it was a very publicized bet. But at the time, he warned about the two layers of expenses whenever you have fund the funds. So I can't help but but ask, what are your general thoughts on fund the funds ETFs? Yeah, so you know it's um it's interesting because uh, there's actually a great quote from Buffett that says, uh, we don't have to be smarter than the rest. We have to be more disciplined than the rest. And I would argue that one of the one of the the big successes of Warren Buffett over time is not only is he smarter than most of other investors, but he is much more disciplined to his actual methodology than most other people have the ability to be. And so, you know, I, I literally name the fund company Discipline Funds because the whole ethos for me is that the older I get and the more experience I have, the more I come to the belief that the investor's biggest problem is usually themselves. And it's their ability not just to find a strategy, but to remain disciplined to a strategy. And so I love this. Um, there was this study that came out in dieting circles um, about five years ago where they, these academics, they studied all these different fad diets and you know Atkins diet and keto and all these popular diets that everybody loves and claims work so great. And what they found was that the diet that worked the best was the one that you stuck with. It didn't even matter which diet you actually picked. It was the diet that worked for people was the one that people could remain disciplined to. And to me, investing is so similar in that we spend so much time trying to pick and choose the absolute best strategies that are out there. And we look at back tests and we look at, you know, manager performance and things like that. When for the most part, I think a lot of people should spend more time picking a strategy that is aligned with their financial goals and then making sure that it's something that you can stick with, because that's one of the biggest hurdles that people have to overcome is this, this constant lure of, you know, the grass is always greener somewhere else. And you're going to, you're going to always see strategies that look better than yours. And you're going to constantly question, well, you know, I'm underperforming now. I could be doing better. Why don't I just switch everything into, you know, Kathy Woods fund and, or whatever it is, whatever the hot shot fund is of the day. And what we often find is that the money weighted returns of these strategies over time, you know, there's old academic research going back ages and ages showing that money tends to chase returns. And it's because we're undisciplined about the way that we approach all of this. And so to me, um, it, it's not, you know, I don't have any problem with people trying to generate actual alpha or picking stocks or doing anything that's really customized to them and what they prefer. But to me, it has to be aligned with the goal of being able to generate what I call behavioral alpha, which is the ability to perform better than you otherwise would because you remain disciplined through essentially the most traumatic time. So can you can you implement a strategy that not only does well from 2015 to 2020, but also during March of 2020 when it's scaring the daylights out of you? Can you stick with that strategy and reap the benefits of the big upturn? And that's the kicker is that a lot of people, they aren't able to actually stick with a strategy when the going gets tough. And that behavioral bias, that behavioral risk creates a huge amount of financial risk. And so to me, it's, um, it's not that 
generating excess return or generating alpha is a bad goal. It's that you have to be, I think, somewhat careful of whether or not when you're reaching for return and reaching for alpha, are you potentially creating behavioral risks where you create essentially a conflict of interest? And that to me, if you can kind of meld the two where you're implementing a strategy that is to some degree um, achieving you know, some, some degree of excess return relative to a counterfactual, but more importantly, helping you remain comfortable and sleep all night. Well, that's the best of all worlds. So, and, and I also should say here uh, that Warren Buffett won that bet. And so, and that was why I was, I was curious, like it's not to demonize everyone who is like doing fund of funds. I think it's important to understand what fund of funds are really, really doing and, and why, uh, why people are, are doing it. Um, but hey, so let's, let's specifically talk about the, your, your new ETF. Um, so in your ETF column, you have six ETFs and right now you have a 45% weight into stocks and 55% in bonds. And here on the show, we often talked and wondered why investors uh, who are not required by regulation to buy, say, long-term bonds would invest in them. Uh, and this is due to the, to the, uh, low yield and inflation prospects. Mm -hmm. Now, so I'm putting you in the hot seat here, as you can probably tell here, Colin. <laughs> so in you ETF, you have a 13.75% uh, exposure to Vanguard's long-term bond fund. Why do you have that? Uh, so again, going back to sort of, I'll give people the framework for, for how I structured the fund in, in essence. I'm starting from what is essentially a global market cap weighting. And so at present, the, the global market cap weighting of stocks versus bonds is about 45, 55 stocks versus bonds. And so our, our allocation, technically, we have about a 50-50 benchmark is the, the goal that we structured. And so the current 45, 55 weighting for us is a little bit below our benchmark. And the, the fund itself actually the goal of it is again to create something that is really well diversified that is helping people keep sort of a bucket of their savings that they can remain disciplined with to a large degree and so one of the problems that i have with index funds and your typical for instance just cherry picking like a 60 40 index fund is that the problem that i've run into with people is that that 60 percent weighting is it exposes you to a lot more risk than people realize. And so you think you're building this nice little savings bucket here where you've got like your retirement in the 60-40. And the reality is that that neat little savings instrument can be a lot riskier than a lot of people realize. And so for instance, in 2008, 60-40 falls 35% in large part because something that people don't realize is that even though we call like Vanguard calls their 6040 a balanced index fund. And that fund is not balanced at all in terms of where its risk actually comes from. That fund actually derives about 85% of its volatility from the 60 percent stock slice. So the, the stocks are so much more volatile inside of that aggregate portfolio that what happens over time is that there's certain periods where the, un, the the principal risk, the negative volatility of that portfolio is extremely exacerbated. And so I would argue that the way that most index funds rebalance is not necessarily aligned with the way that people actually perceive risk. So for instance, 60-40, it grows into 70-30. And Vanguard just systematically says, well, we're going to rebalance back to 60-40 because I don't know, because that's the the weighting that they like for whatever you know quantitative reason or 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 subjective reason that they they decided that sixty was the right number. I actually go in and I look at the equity piece relative to the bond piece, and I say, and I actually constructed an algorithm that tries to essentially quantify, well, how risky is that stock piece relative to the bond piece at certain times? And so typically, what this thing is doing is it's trying to quantify essentially where we are in a market cycle and whether or not we're riskier in the stock sleeve than we are on average. And so right now with the weighting being slightly underweight stocks, I would argue that the, the algorithm is basically consistent with an environment where the stock market is being quantified as relatively above risk uh, in terms of its historical weight. And so 
rather than just rebalancing back to this fixed weighting, we actually rebalance somewhat more dynamically. So this thing actually, right now it's 45.55, but it can move within a band of 70, 30 to 30, 70. So it, it can, it never gets all in or all out. It's designed to help people stay the course through thick and thin. So you're always invested in stocks and bonds through thick and thin, but you're, you're dynamically rebalancing across time. And again, doing so pretty passively, um, but in a way that I hope is creating a more stable, a little smoother ride for people so that they can remain essentially more disciplined to the strategy over time. And a big kicker with that is that one of the, the hedges, one of the most important hedges during negative periods is long-term bonds. And so typically what will happen is that as you actually see the equity slice shrink inside of our portfolio, you see that a long-term bond allocation will actually grow. So for instance, um, I mean, two years ago, we didn't even own a long-term bond position inside of the portfolios. And so, um, you know, even though I, I've been running this strategy for 10 years outside of client portfolios, even though we just issued the ETF, but I didn't own any long-term bonds in this thing two years ago. Whereas as the equity sleeve shrinks and the equity market is perceived as riskier, it actually grows a little longer duration in the bond piece because the the kicker is that we know that during periods of of really traumatic market downturns long-term treasury bonds tend to be the instrument that is always the safe haven so you see it in in march of 2020 you see it during the great financial crisis these periods of really traumatic financial market downturns people tend to run to the safe haven that is long-term treasury bonds. And so it's a little bit counterintuitive to own something like tr long-term treasury bonds in an environment where, you know, I just went on a, a rant saying that long-term treasury bonds are totally different animals than they were 30 years ago. And while that's true, it's also true that they could be the most important sleep well aspect of your portfolio at the time when you most need them to be. And that's, that's the kicker is that, in a weird way right now, cash and treasury bills, they can't provide you with an uncorrelated return that long-term treasury bonds will. And so, well, it might be a little bit uncomfortable to own these things during periods where, you know, it, the risk reward doesn't look great. It could turn out that during the periods when the stock market is, is scaring you, that this is the component of the portfolio that's actually providing you with the most important hedge. And the you know, helping you to remain, uh, stay the course and remain more disciplined because that component is helping reduce the underlying instability of the equity positions. Yeah, you know, you know, it's a, it's an interesting approach. And it, it also makes me think of Redalio's all weather portfolio, where he always wants to have long term bonds, even though it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's appealing. But like, that portfolio is constructed with the mindset of, we just don't know this might look appealing or this looks to happen but we don't know and that's why that's why it's constructed the way uh, that it is um and i guess i guess that's also a nice segue to talk a, a bit about uh, the fed you know sell an, an episode here on we study billionaires without talking about the fed and you know um one of the latest signals that we have from fed here uh, during powell is that it looks like we will most likely be facing interest rate hikes perhaps in 2022 20, already and so you know, on one hand, the value of our current bonds goes down, um, but it also implies that bonds purchased in the future will have a more attractive yield. And so, and I'm saying this because bond ETFs are typically replacing bonds uh, that have matured with newly issued uh, bonds continuously. Uh, it's like it's it's being ignorant of what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, so how should we as investors in the bond ETF look whenever uh jerome powell saying oh we're going to to hike rates yeah so this is as great as etfs are this is one of the difficulties with etfs that in some ways etfs create behavioral risks that wouldn't otherwise exist so for instance um i remember i mean i used to sell bonds at merrill lynch back in the early 2000s and um one of the nice things about about selling literal paper bonds to people is that they just have a piece of paper that says 
you know, XYZ certificate is worth $100 and you you receive a coupon in the mail every, you know, month or quarter or whatever. And you don't actually see that the value of that piece of paper changes because you just have a piece of paper that says, you know, $100 or whatever. And one of the behavioral problems with bond ETFs is that you can literally log in to your Vanguard account or your Schwab account or your Robinhood account or whatever. And you can see that the value of that thing changes every day. And so it's, it can be harder for people to actually behave well with bond ETFs because they're able to see what the actual price changes are. And that creates behavioral risk that it just didn't exist because people literally just didn't know what the value of their underlying bonds were before. So you were more likely to hold things to maturity inside of uh, just holding a paper, a paper bond because in large part, you just you knew that that thing was going to mature at par and you didn't care whether or not the current value of it was $90 because you knew it was going to be worth $100 in the long run. So ETFs are different and they they create that behavioral risk. But I think it's really important to sort of compartmentalize. I I love this when you're looking at things from this sort of savings portfolio perspective that I was referring to earlier. I really like bucketing things across specific time horizons. And so if you're going to own a bond ETF or a short term um, T-bill like instrument or anything like that, it's very useful, I think, to be able to match these things to certain time horizons across your portfolio. So, for instance, if um, if you needed cash in the next three years, you wouldn't want to go out and buy a 10 year treasury bond ETF for that money because that fund will expose you to principal volatility that it could persist through most of that 10 year period. Yeah, on average in a bond ETF, the likelihood of that thing losing principal value is low because the underlying bonds are consistently maturing at par. But in the short term, that bond fund could be incredibly volatile and could expose you to periods where inside of a three year period, you actually have a principal loss. And so it would be much more sensible to look at something like a three-year CD or you know, a, a maybe even a five-year treasury bond at, at most, where you're better aligning the time horizons with the specific instruments. So you know, regarding Fed policy and Fed interest rate hikes specifically, um, I mean, again, this is one of those things that you you have to make a prediction about the future, but it's also it's also virtually impossible to predict what future interest rates are going to be. I mean, Greenspan spent, you know, five years raising interest rates before the housing boom, trying to, you know, grapple with what was perceived as a potential housing bus or a housing boom and um, and housing bubble. And he couldn't make long term rates go up. You know, Greenspan called this the great conundrum back in the, the 2000s. And so you know, it's one of those things where I I don't know what's going to happen. My my guess is that has been that interest rates will be lower for longer and that the the likelihood of returning to a 1970s style outcome is not very high because I just think there's so many different, you know, demographic trends and technological trends and globalization trends that the the likelihood of moving back into a, a very high interest rate environment is low. So um, but at the same time, we're diversifying across bonds in large part because we don't know. So again, it's kind of following this philosophy of own everything and you know manage it to your behavior, but own everything because we don't really know what's going to happen. And we don't know if the yield curve could completely flatten from here and invert. The Fed could raise rates a bunch and get scared of inflation and cause the whole economy in, to drive into a recession, which would be deflationary, which would cause long-term bonds to outperform. And so there's all these scenarios where, yes, maybe long-term interest rates go up, but there's also plausible scenarios where maybe the Fed raises rates a lot, drives the economy into a recession, and actually, in a weird way, causes a repeat of this conundrum, and interest rates end up going lower, and you start seeing deflation across the whole economy. And then we're looking at another period where long-term treasury bonds are again, the best performing asset class across time. You know, I've, and I've heard that narrative my whole career, literally since the day I stepped foot on Wall Street, people have been telling me you cannot own long-term bonds because interest rates are low and the risks are too high. 
And so I've sort of just arrived at this conclusion that everyone's been wrong about this for 20 to 30 years or more. And so, you know, as Bogle said, nobody knows nothing. We can make good guesses and you need to construct a portfolio that is behaviorally consistent and well diversified. But, you know, I, I don't pretend to know where interest rates are going to go. So we want to be diversified knowing that, you know, if the equity piece falls apart, then we're diversified in a way that is really going to protect us in that scenario. And so that's, you know, that's why we own some long-term bonds. And it's why I think most people should construct a diversified portfolio that applies this sort of asset liability matching perspective where they're, they're really not just controlling for their short-term liquidity needs, but also maintaining a fairly long time horizon where they have assets that can potentially reap the benefits of incurring the the, the structural underlying um, you know components of what these instruments are designed to do over the long term. Yeah, and I think that's a good segue uh, into talking about that. You. Know, no one knows, like you, like you mentioned, you know, you were quoting uh, Bogle there, like no one really knows. We have a lot of indicators suggesting one thing or, or the other, but no one knows for sure where different markets are, are heading. And so, you know, whenever whenever I think about the uh, last time you were here on the show, uh, back in episode 370 or your masterclass on inflation, you know, this was, first of all, it was, it was absolutely amazing. Everyone should go back and, and listen to that. But... I can't help but think now that we're talking about ETF investing, and you talked about your own ETF also, and how should we as ETF investors think about inflation and protect us against that? Because one thing that I did notice in your uh, in your ETF, and I can't help but but calling out, you know, traditional vehicles to protect against inflation. That's very often, uh, you know, gold and commodities. That's what we learned from Red Dalio and his old weather portfolio. Uh, whenever I look at at, at your ETF, uh, you know, stocks and bonds. So how how, does, how should we think about it? And, and not just specifically related to, to your ETF, but just in, just in general for us investors. Yeah, so I love, I love Ray Dalio's all weather approach, risk parity. I mean, I am essentially trying to build a very simple version of risk parity. I'm trying to literally keep parity between the risk exposures of the stock and bond components in the portfolio and the way that we, we rebalance counter cyclically. Um, you know, and I, I love, um, like Harry Brown, Harry Brown's uh, permanent portfolio, I think is a fantastic portfolio. One of, you know, one of the, it, it, working from a first principles perspective, it's a very sound approach to asset allocation. What I did with this ETF was this thing is just a very simple, very diversified allocation that it, it keeps things simple and no more complex than I really think they should be. And so my my only problem with owning commodities and gold inside of your financial asset portfolio is that they can be expensive ways to get exposure to these instruments. So in my opinion, investors can protect themselves from inflation in less expensive ways or ways that, you know, just they don't have the, the taxes and fees necessarily that a lot of these these publicly available instruments uh, expose you to. So, you know, the inside of the discipline fund, to me, in the long run, the stock market is a very good inflation hedge in the long run. It won't always provide you with an inflation hedge in the long term, but over the long term, because you're basically buying what is a stream of future corporate profits, you have, in essence, a, a certain sense of embedded purchasing power protection inside of that portfolio. So I like using the stock market specifically as a growth and purchasing power protection component of your portfolio. And the bond component in there is specifically a principal hedge. It's not designed to generate real returns. In fact, you should expect it to lose to inflation in the long run. And that's fine. They're serving totally different needs. If you really wanted to own other asset classes, I have no problem with people owning gold or, you know, commodities or other types of inflation hedges. In fact, I've, I've been a proponent of that pretty vocally for the last, especially since COVID hit, because I, 
I said that the fiscal stimulus would be at least somewhat inflationary. But I think that most people, the average American at least, I mean, has one of the best inflation hedges in owning a home, for instance. So, you know, owning real assets is a very, very sensible way to to obtain an inflation hedge. And to me, your financial assets, sure, owning gold inside of your financial assets or owning commodities can be a fine way to get inflation protection. In my opinion, most people already have a lot of inflation protection outside of their financial asset portfolio. So the way that I generally just default to building a financial asset portfolio is to simplify, simplify, simplify. And that's really my methodology. And so to keep costs low and to keep things very diversified, we only use stocks and bonds because I think that the a commodity component and a gold component it unnecessarily complicates things in a way that my fund is just not necessarily trying to to protect you from. So, Colin, what can I say? This has been absolutely amazing once again to to have you on our show. I'm already looking forward. I'm always looking forward to having these discussions, and well, hopefully, we can already say that we're going to invite you back next quarter. But in the meantime, uh, where can the audience learn more about you, Promatic Capitalism, and your new fund? Uh, discipline funds. Yeah, so I, I write the blog, Pragmatic Capitalism. I'm on Twitter at Cullen Roach, uh, just one word. And uh, Discipline Funds is the disciplinefunds.com. The ETF is the Discipline Fund. The ticker is DSCF. It's on the New York Stock Exchange every day. Um, well, not every day, Monday through Friday. <laughs> right. But um, yeah, so that's that's where you can find me. And, um, you know, like I always say, I love to try to spread the knowledge and help people as best I can. Um, and if you're you're looking for help to try to sort of navigate all of this, you know, what seems to be an increasingly complex and and confusing financial world. Um, you know, I obviously, like I said, a lot of times I, I don't know. I don't know everything, but I, I've spent more time than was healthy uh obsessing over all of this and thinking about it and trying to build a, a nice clean simple approach to to navigating it all so i'm i love answering questions though so feel free to email me cullen roach at gmail um or cullen roach at discipline funds and uh you know i can field questions or or help people in any way that i can Absolutely amazing. And thank you for spending so much time on it. And, and so you can come here on the show and educate our audience, um, Colin. Really, really appreciate it. Um, so as we are, as we are letting uh, you go here, I just want to say to the audience, make sure to follow the Investors Podcast on your favorite podcast app. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe to get more content like this. Uh, Colin, I hope we can see you soon again. I'm sure we will. Thanks, Dig. Take care, everybody. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.